Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, I would like to talk today about um, function limit for compounded functions. Compounded in terms of function from a function. Um, well, this lecture is part of the course which is offered on unizor.com. It's advanced mathematics for teenagers and high school students. I suggest you to watch this lecture from this website because parallel to the video there is a very nice explanation of everything which I'm talking about and uh, in case of a problem, let's say, then some problems are actually solved in writing as well as during the lecture and uh, if we are talking about theorems then most likely the proof of the theorem in writing is among the notes. Alright, so we are talking about compounding functions. Alright, so let's assume that we have two functions function f which is defined defined for all real values x so its domain is all real x all real values x um, and another function g of x which also is defined for all real um, argument x. Now, let's assume that both functions are continuous. It's important. And let me just remind you that a uh, function is called continuous if um, whenever it goes to a certain limit, if argument goes to some, um, some value, then continuous function has a value uh, oops. equals to L in this point. So whenever we are moving, okay, this is point R and this is L. So whenever we are moving towards point R, from here or from here, we have certain limit. And limit should actually be equal to the value at that particular point. Then the function is continuous. We talked about this in one of the previous lectures. So, both functions are continuous. Both functions are defined for all real uh, arguments. Now, let's assume that this function goes to value L as x goes to r. Now, we plan to do g of f of x. So whenever x goes to r, my f of x goes to l. So argument of g goes to l. So I would like to have that this is uh, approaching the limit m is if, f, if, if, if x goes to l. So, what does it mean? Now, I'm taking some value x, which I will uh, uh, I, I will use it to approach point R. Now, my f at x will be going to L in this particular case, because that's what I have suggested as a premise of the theorem. Now, if f at x goes to L, then under argument of function g I have something which is approaching L and I know that if argument of g goes to L then the function goes to M so that actually is supposed to approach M as x goes to R right so this is basically the theorem so if this is given and the functions are continuous and defined for all real uh, values of arguments, then this must be the case. Well, how can I prove it? Well, let's just start from the definition of the limit. Now, what does it mean that my function goes to limit m if its argument goes to r? Well, it means that for any positive epsilon, however small, 
which will measure our distance from this value to m. I should find, so there exists some kind of a delta such that if my argument is within delta neighborhood of, of R, then my function would be within epsilon neighborhood of M. So that's what we have to do. So for any epsilon, if exists such a delta, for any epsilon exists delta, such that from the closeness of the argument to the point uh, of the limit, we have the closeness of the function to its limit, the closeness is measured, is measured by epsilon, then we have the function really has m as, as, as a limit. So our purpose is for any epsilon to find delta. Well, okay, how can we do it? Well, let's think about it this way. I know that g is a function which is continuous function and uh, as x goes to L its argument as x goes to L then the function goes to M which means that for this partic particular epsilon so we just take any epsilon I know that there is a delta such that if g of x minus sorry if x minus um, l is less than delta then g of x minus m would be less than or equal to epsilon. So I know that I can find this delta, right? Now, I also know that this function is continuous and has a limit L if R goes to, uh, if X goes to R. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that that for any epsilon there is a delta such that if my argument is in the delta neighborhood of point R then function would be in the L in the epsilon neighborhood of L that's what I know right now now let me do it this way Again, start from the beginning. For any epsilon greater than zero, I know how to find delta such that if my x is in the delta neighborhood of L, then my g would be in epsilon neighborhood of M. Now, I know that this delta, I can use this delta instead of this. And for this delta, doesn't matter which letter, which letter I use, epsilon, theta, right? So first I find, I, I find this delta. Then for this delta, I found something like gamma, such that if x minus r less than gamma, then f at x minus l would be less than delta, right? So basically, I just change letters here. Now, my delta is this one which I know how to find. Now, I know how to find it because I know that g of x has a limit m, right? As x goes to l. So, for any epsilon, whatever epsilon I, I can choose, I can find such a delta that from this follows this. Now, how can I make sure that this is performed, this is true? Well, 
very easily. I take for this particular delta, I can find gamma such that, it, such that from this follows this. Now what happens? Now what happens with the function g of f of x of x? I know that for this epsilon we have found such a delta and for this delta we have found gamma. So if this is true, then this is true. But if this is true, then it's basically follows from this that this minus this would be less than epsilon. Which is exactly what we need. So again, let me just repeat again the steps. I choose any epsilon greater than zero. I know how to find delta for which this is a true statement. From this follows this. Then for this delta, I find gamma based on the properties of the f function uh, that from this follows this. And now I'm using basically this gamma as the neighborhood of, of point R which which results in the following. If my x minus r is less than gamma, then what happens? Then first we have this. And then from this, this is the same, right? We have this instead of x. I just put f at x. And that's the end of the proof. So we found, for any epsilon, we found first delta, and for delta we found gamma, and that gamma is exactly the neighborhood of the point R. If we are within that gamma neighborhood of R, then my g of f of x would be within the epsilon neighborhood of m. Okay. Now, intuitively, it's kind of obvious, but um, relatively rigorous proof is always the good thing to know. Now, let me just make a couple of notes. Uh, first of all, we started from the uh, requirement that both functions are um, defined for all real um, values of argument. Basically, it's not really necessary because we do need existence of this which means domain of function g should include codomain of function f of function uh, f now when i say when I, when I say that all functions should actually be defined for all real values of argument that's kind of overshoot i can actually concentrate on a little bit smaller um kind of definition smaller requirements rather and uh, say that g should be defined wherever function f at x has values. But it's really such a minor point and it doesn't really matter quite frankly. In most cases which we will be dealing with, uh, we will definitely have situation uh, when functions defined uh, uh, almost everywhere. That's number one. Another function, another requirement sir, which we, which we were discussing here was requirement that the functions are continuous. That is actually important. And here is why. Consider this case. You have f of x is equal to 0, always, for all x. Now, g of x is equal to 1 if x is 0 and 0 if x is not 0. So the graph of the function g of x would be like this. It would be 0 everywhere here and 0 everywhere here, but at point 0 it will be 1. So one point would be uh, lifted from the line uh, upwards. Now, what happens if my g of x goes to, uh, it goes to 0 
as x goes to 0, right? Because no matter from which side we approach 0, since the values are 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, whatever is 0, r limit would be 0, right? So this is my L. No, this is my M. And this is my L. Now, function f at x would go to 0 as x goes to 0. This is my L and this is my R in my previous. So what happens with the function g of f of x? Well, what's interesting is that this function is always equals to 1. Why? Because f of x is al always equals to 0 and function g is always equal to 1 if x is equal to 0. So, I have this value always, which means the limit of this will be also 1 as x goes to 0. But, it's obviously not the same if you will use this one, right? You will have 0 here. So it looks like this continuity of the function g is very, very important. You will not have... You will not have this this nice things that the uh, limit of limit of function g of f of x uh, would be equals to correspondingly you had you had f of x goes to l you had g of x goes to m right and then I said that the g of f of x should be should should go to m. Now this is not correct in this case because this is goes to one, and m is equals to zero. This is m is equal to zero. So this is example of where we really need the continuity. This kind of a one point uh, lifted from from the from the line, basically breaking continuity breaks the whole rule of relationship between the limits. So continuity is important. So all these nice uh, uh, properties of the compound function are good only if the functions are continuous. So that's very important. Okay, now how about a couple of limits for instance where we can actually use this particular property and why we started talking about this. Well, basically, um, I can just summarize it in, in, in a very kind of a short phrase that in some good cases, limit of the function is equal to function of limits. Let, let, let me put it this way. Um, again, let me just say it again. If you have f of x goes to L as x goes to R, g of x goes to M as x goes to L. Now we are talking about g of f of x. So limit of function is equal to function of limit. Now, function of limit is g of f of r, right? Now, function f is continuous, so f at r is equal to the limit of f at x when x goes to r. So, this is equal to L, and this is g of L. And g is continuous function, so as x goes to L, function g goes to m, and this is supposed to be m for a continuous function, right? Again, we are using continuity. So as you see, the limit of this 
as x goes to r is equal to function. So limit of function is equal to function of limit. That's basically in two words what, what I was just trying to prove you. Now, how can it be, that's what I just wanted to exemplify. How can you use it as an example, for instance? Well, here is one of the uh, things. You remember among amazing limits, oops, I was talking about this limit as x goes to zero, right? You remember that? Um, okay, now let's do it slightly differently. Instead of some x goes to infinity, I can have some function um, which goes to uh, x goes to zero. I can have some function which goes to zero. For instance, one over x as this is my f as x goes to infinity. So my r would be infinity. My f at x would be 1 over x. And as r goes to infinity, it goes to 0. Now this is my g of x. So what is my, what is my g of f of x? Well, it's a sine of 1 over x divided by 1 over x, right? That's what it is, which is equal to x sine 1 over x and now x goes to infinity so what can I say right now that this has the limit of 1 as x goes to infinity so that's where I was using uh, I had a completely different function and completely different um, limit point. This limit point is zero, this limit point is infinity. But I have replaced argument to this g of x function with function f at x which is 1 over x. And now I can say that if r goes to infinity, 1 over x goes to zero. Argument goes to zero, so the function goes to 1. So that's what basically I did. This is m in my terminology and this is l in my terminology. This is l. So argument to r, this function to l, which is 0, happened to be, and I know about what happens with this function if argument goes to 0. So I can say that the combined function has this same limit m. Now, something like this can be used in many other cases. All you have to do, you have to recognize that if I'm, for instance, asking you what is the limit of this when x goes to infinity, you should recognize that basically this is nothing but a composition of two functions. One is the familiar one from amazing limits, and another is 1 over x, which is continuous function um, and uh, you can use this compound function theorem about limits to basically uh, re reduce this limit to finding the limit of a compounding function which you know how to do based on whatever the theorem I just proved. Okay, I do suggest you to read the notes because the notes might have some um, uh, better examples or, or different examples than I was just um, uh, saying. Um, and uh, other than that, um, I think I will have certain exercises where I will try to put these examples of compounding as, as a good technique to find the limit whenever you really need to know what's the limit of the function. And you should be able to recognize how to make whatever whatever the exercise actually says to have the limit of how to make it into a composition of functions which you already know how to uh, how to take the limits of 
All right, that's it. Thank you very much and good luck.